Wednesday. Lack of sleep has gotten my days all mixed up. Page 882, with John Dunn and a valediction for Betty Morty. And we got to just about 10, 11, 12. I think we finished line 12. I had up over here on the board, you know, the, the spheres. Earth, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Outside the last sphere is the Empyrean, which is where God dwells. This is the Ptolemaic or geocentric conception of the world with Earth, not world, with Earth at the center and everything else revolving around us. And we talked about trepidation of the spheres, that is the movement of the spheres, though greater far than an earthquake, Dunn says is innocent. Why? Because in 1610, notice this poem is written in 1611. In 1610, a famous astronomer published his findings proving that three earlier astronomers were correct. The three earlier astronomers Copernicus, um, Kepler, and a guy named Tycho Brahe. This astronomer, Galileo. Galileo proved in 1610 this old idea of how the universe, you know, is structured was wrong. That's why Dunn could write in 1611. Trepidation of the spheres, though greater far, is innocent. What does he mean by innocent? You can pick up today in the Daily News Journal, I'm pretty sure Daily News Journal has it, Tennessean I know has it, and you can go to a place over on, real close to the intersection of Memorial and Clark. Um, and you can have your horoscope read, or you can read your horoscope in the newspaper. What is the whole horoscope idea based on? This. This is the basis of astrology. Okay? So, Dunn then goes on and says, or the speaker goes on and says, Dull sublunary lovers love whose soulless sense cannot admit absence because it doth remove those things which elemented it. And I had another little picture. Here's Earth. Here's the moon. And the moon orbits around the Earth. So everything below the moon is sublunary. And that meant, according to people in Dunn's day and earlier, that it's changeable. It's mutable. It's impermanent. So notice what the speaker says. Dull Sublunary lovers love. That is, people whose love is based down here, beneath, beneath the orbit of the moon. How does it mean based? Whose soul is sense. That's how it's based. The soul, the essence of their love, is based upon what? The five senses. Seeing, hearing, Touching, tasting, smelling. Those people, people who love on the basis of, let's be, you know, real shallow, looks and looks alone. What happens when the looks leave? Either physically, like she leaves the room, if male, let's say, or think back to, to the virgins to make much of time, or to his coy mistress, and time takes its toll, and the looks leave that way. Well, dull sublunary lovers love, whose soul is sense, cannot admit absence. Why? Because if I love you because of how you look to me, then what happens when you no longer look to me? You step out the room. Well, if my love is totally based upon sensory perception, 
then what am I going to do? I'm going to start looking for something else, somebody else to love. The old, it's either Elver or Stephen Bishop, song from the late 70s. Yeah, it's late 70s. If you can't love the one you love, but you know how the rest of the lyric goes? Love the one you're with. So, if your lover is out of town, find somebody else to you know, keep you uh, occupied. Why? Their souls cannot admit, their love cannot admit absence because absence removes those things which elemented, which formed their love. But we, notice, the we here is juxtaposed to everybody out there. Why? First stanza. He says, um, excuse me, second stanza, he talks about a profanation of our joys to tell the laity our load. So the laity is everybody out there. We are somehow separate. We by a love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is. Enter assured of the mind, care less eyes, lips, and hands to this. Our love, the speaker is saying, isn't sublunary. It's what? It's refined. And what's the basis of their love? Honey, why do you love me? I don't know. See, I'm going to address the men here. There's never a right answer. Don't go, oh, it's because of your body or it's because of your smile. Uh-uh. Because what happens when the body goes to hell or the smile, you know, you have a stroke and you're like this. Well, then, you know, you find a new. There's no correct answer to that. And if you get really deep about it, it's like, okay. So if you're in love with someone, why do you love that person? What causes that? I think the only correct answer is it's because you. you. That's it. It's, it's it, the whole package, so to speak. So he, that's why he says, we care less eyes, lips, or hands to I don't need to see you. I don't need to kiss you. I don't need to touch you. Why? Go back to the previous line. We are interassured of the mind. That's where their love is. They've got a connection of the mind. Not intellectual. I love you because I'm two and you two are together. We make, no, not that kind of thing. So he brings up another image. Our two souls, therefore... Our two souls, therefore, which are one, why are the two souls one? And the two shall become one. It's part of the marriage vows, marriage ceremony. Goes back to the book of Genesis. Though I must go, endure not yet a breach, but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness beat. Well, the story about this poem is that Dunn, the author, was getting ready to take a trip to the continent, to go to Europe. And his wife wanted to come. And he said, no, you can't. She wanted to come because she was pregnant at the time. And she had a premonition that something would happen if he left. And he's like, don't worry about it. Everything will be okay. Turns out she had a stillbirth. It actually happened. Okay? So, if our two souls are one... They endure not yet a breach, but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness beat. What kind of metal is gold? Other than rare. Malleable. Malleable. What does that mean? You can shape it. You can pound it really thin. You could literally, if you wanted to, get a bar of gold and pound it thin enough to replace one of those panes of glass. You could use it like a window. It'd be kind of gold-tinged. Everything that you saw through there. Okay. But it's not brittle like others, some other metals are, where if you smack them with a hammer, they shatter. So he says, Our souls, they're like gold, honey. And the implication is that image doesn't work. That metaphysical conceit doesn't connect. Remember, metaphysical conceit is, I said, a Bringing together of two dissimilar things, right? Souls to gold. Immaterial, material. How do you connect those? So he goes, oh, okay, let me use another image. If they are two, they're what? 
There are two, as stiff twin compasses are two. What does he mean, stiff twin compasses? He means the kind of compass you use in a geometry class to inscribe a circle. So here's one leg of the compass. This is the one, let's say, with the point. And this is the one with the pencil lead or other marker of some kind in it. Right? So what happens? Thy soul, the fixed foot, she's the permanent one. Will what? He says, thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth if the other do, right? If they're just sitting there like this, they're going to just sit there like forever. But what happens when you move the foot of this one? Keeping the foot on the plane. That one bends after. The farther you move this one away, the farther that one bends. Why? Because they're connected. So, and though it in the center sit, that is, in the center of the, let's use this image again, if her soul is, now let me use a different one, if her soul is here and his bends out, what does it do? If I had an actual compass, I would make a circle around there, and her soul becomes what? It's the dead center. It's what makes this circle perfect. Okay? But only if what? What happens if you're trying to make a circle freehand? It's kind of a fat squat circle, right? It's not a perfect circle. Why not? I don't have anything to reference to make that circle perfect. I need this. So if I could rotate all the way around that, it would work. So your firmness, he says, and though it in the center sit, yet when the other far doth roam, that is me, when I go off to Europe, and though you're sitting back here in London, what? Your soul leans after mine. Right? You're in love with somebody, you've got to take a trip. What does almost, I won't say everyone, because, you know, some people, in my opinion, are weird. What does almost everyone do the first night of the travel? You call. Why? Good flight, safe travels, how's everything going? You don't go, see you later, and then just go off about your life. Right? So, hearkens after it and does what? Grows erect as I come back. What causes this one to come back home? This one's fixedness. So, the speaker says, such wilt thou be to me, who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. Oblique at an angle from you. I've got to, it's work. And if you don't stay put, what's the implication? I won't come back home. I'll do what? I won't be a circle. I'll be an ellipse. Right? This is a perfect orbit. This, you know, asteroid. Three asteroids are supposed to zip by Earth this weekend. One of them closer than the moon. Well, yeah, they have orbits. Are they round orbits? No. Because they come around the sun. Gravity slingshots them away. So, he says, thy firmness makes my circle just and makes me end where I begun. So the metaphysical conceit, he's compared their relationship to what? Two legs of a compass. Now, that's weird. Right? Who would think up something like that? Well, Dunn would. And Dunn comes up with a bunch of these. Turn, for example, to the next poem by Dunn we're going to do, which is on 1348. So I can lose that one now. I can leave that one. 1348. 
We're not doing Battle My Heart. We're going to do that in a few days. The Flea. Now, I need to mention, because I haven't mentioned it before. Dunn wrote slightly over 200 poems, about 205 or so. Of those, he only published during his lifetime about five. All the others were copied by friends and other people. Okay. Dunn, as I said, you know, wrote in the very late 16th and early 17th century. So he wrote about 200 poems, let's say. Over 5,000 copies of these survive. More copies of Dunn's poems survive in the 17th century than any other poet. More than Shakespeare, for example. What this tells us is people really liked his poems. And the ones that he copied the most are the dirtier of them. Because he wrote a lot of dirty poems before he became an Anglican priest. Once he becomes an Anglican priest, he only like, writes religious poetry or poems for people who've died. People, you know, poems to commemorate people. This is one of the poems he wrote before he became an Anglican priest. The Flea. And it might help when we read this poem for you to substitute instead of a flea, since we're in the South, a tick. Because he's going to use an image of the flea biting one person, biting another person, and then kind of swelling from their blood. Well, we don't normally think of, tick, of fleas doing that. But ticks, you do. Ticks get, you know, big and swollen. And... So, three stanzas. Mark but this flea. Mark there means note. Look at this flea. And note in this, that is, this idea I'm going to draw from this flea, how little that which thou denies me is. What is the person being addressed denying the speaker? Well, we don't know exactly yet because we've only gotten in two lines. But it's going to be pretty clear within the end of this stanza. It sucked me first and now sucks thee, and in this flea are two bloods mingled be. Back up for a moment. In Dunn's day, orthography, that is handwriting, the shapes of letters, was still pretty fluid. So, you often have two letters that look very much alike in these days. And this even goes up until, you know, the time of the American founding and like the Declaration of Independence, which is not printed like this book is printed. It's hand copied, okay? So, S and F from 1400 to 1800 can, in handwriting, look almost identical. The only thing that really distinguishes them is an F usually at the beginning of a word has this little bar in it. So this is an F at the beginning of a word, like friend, and this is an S at the beginning of a word, like suck. See where I'm going? Shakespeare and Dunn both pun, excuse me, on the shape of these letters in their poems. So that when Dunn says, it sucked me first and now sucks thee, Dunn knows in the handwriting of the period, sometimes that F doesn't have that little bar across it. So sometimes it looks like an S, and sometimes it looks like an F. It upped me first, and then you, and in this flea are two bloods mingled B. Why? Because if the flea bites them, takes a bite, it sucks a little bit of their blood, and if they have intercourse, their blood's quote-unquote mixed bodily juices, you know, mixed too. And thou knowest that this cannot be said, a sin nor shame nor loss of maidenhead. That is virginity. Yet this enjoys before it woo, and pampered swells with one blood made of two. And this, alas, is more than we would do. So, it's pretty clear the speaker is addressing somebody. Does the somebody ever reply? Not verbally. But the person being addressed does act. Okay? So, first stanza. 
Look at this thing. It bit you, it bit me, and now our bloods are mingling in this flea. The images of sex. And you know that this what? It's not a sin. We've not done anything wrong. Nor is there any shame. That is, your honor is not lessened. Why? Because you've not lost your virginity, your maidenhead. But this enjoys before it flew, before it woo. The flea didn't even have to take you out for dinner. The poet is saying, or the speaker is saying, and pampered swells with one blood made of two. That's an image of what? Pretty clear. Pregnancy. Your blood, my blood, and the flea is getting larger. But, excuse me, and this, alas, is more than we would do. What's the speaker mean with that last line of that first stanza? Don't worry, honey. You're not going to get pregnant. Oh, stay. Three lives and one flea spare. So what's happened between that stand, the first stanza and the second stanza? What does the person being addressed do? It does something to the flea. It pulls the flea off of one of them. Okay? Stop! Don't kill the flea. Where we almost say more than married are. How can you be more than married? I mean, you either are or you aren't, right? No. Married simply means what? That is, let me rephrase this. If you're Catholic, I'm not, Dunn's family was, Dunn had been raised Catholic, right? But if you're Catholic, what can you seek from the Pope or your bishop? An annulment of the marriage. How do you get an annulment? What one thing is a prerequisite for an actual annulment? Louder? Cheating. No, it's not cheating. Then that would grant you a divorce. Annulment means it's like it never happened. Divorce means, yeah, we were married, but now we're not anymore. Why would, how can you get an as if it never happened? You didn't consummate the marriage. You didn't sleep together. You didn't have intercourse. Okay? So you could be married 40 years. Never consummate the marriage and then say, you know, I'm tired of being married to you. And go to the Pope and say, we never consummated the marriage. And the Pope would go, okay then. <clears throat> you were never married. Right? So that's how they are more than married. Married implies you went through the ceremony. You said the I do's. More than married is, and then you actually fulfill those vows, okay, through initially intercourse. So, this flea is you and I. How's that for a medical physical metaphysical conceit? Ladies, you have a significant other, and he or she comes up to you and says, You're a flea, and I'm a flea. What are you more than likely going to do? You're going to hit him or her, okay? So what does he mean? Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Bad wrist. Uh, this flea is you and I, and this, that is the flea, our marriage bed is. Kind of adds a whole new meaning to flea bag hotel or, you know. And marriage temple. Though parents grudge and you, we're met and cloistered in these living walls of jet. Though parents grudge. Your parents grudge our marriage. Well, the marriage he's talking about is the mixture of the fleas. But go back to Dunn's biography that I talked about the other day. Remember, he was 23 when he met his future wife. She was 14. When they were married, she was 17. He was 26. They married uh, surreptitiously. When the marriage was found out three months later, he got thrown in prison for four months. 
yeah, her parents grudged. When I was working on the edition of Dunn's Poetry that I was part of, I found two copies of this poem that did not have those two lines about parents grudging and cloistered in these living walls of Jack. And I think one of the reasons those two lines were omitted in those copies was because whoever copied them thought it might be a little bit close to Dunn's actual experience. So he says, though you make you apt to kill me, let not to that self-murder added be. And sacrilege, three sins and killing three. What does your gloss for use mean if you replace that word use? Though habit make you apt to kill me. Does that help explain the line any? Because it doesn't mean. But I know what it means. Use there means though your use of me makes you apt to kill me. And what Dunn is doing there is he's putting on the late medieval and renaissance notion that every time you have an orgasm, you die a little bit. You, you give up a little bit of your spirit. So, you have all kinds of Renaissance poets play with that idea. Speaker gets into bed with, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, and says, kill me. Kill me again. Kill me more. Dunn has a poem that talks about dying and rising again. Dying and rising again. Okay? That's the use make you apt to kill me. Your use of me. Let not to that self-murder added be. Because self-murder is what? Suicide is the unforgivable sin. You can't kill yourself and go, sorry, God, afterwards. And sacrilege, three sins and killing three. How is that sacrilege? Three sins in killing three. Three is the number of what? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In killing the Trinity kind of a thing. Okay? So, something happens between stanza 2 and stanza 3. Stanza 1, Mark but this flea, draws our attention to it. Stanza 2, stop, don't kill the flea. Stanza 3, cruel and sudden hast thou since purple thy nail in blood of innocence. Well, if you've ever had a flea on you or on an animal and you pull the flea off, how do you kill the flea? You don't drop the flea on the ground and step on it. Why? That doesn't work. you got to get it between your fingernail and your index finger. Cut it in two. That's what she does. She did what? She purpled her nail. So she has blood on her fingernail in blood of innocence. Why innocence? Because I'm not guilty of the blood that the flea sucked from me. And you're not guilty of the blood that the flea sucked from you. And guess what? The flea isn't guilty of anything either. Why? Because fleas are all moral creatures. You don't blame a flea for biting you. Because that's what fleas do. You don't, even though we want to, you don't blame a mosquito and I'm somebody mosquitoes just love. I can go outside and pfft, okay? Sweet blood, as my wife calls it. It doesn't mean I go, you damn mosquito, you know, rotten it. No, it's just a mosquito being what a mosquito is. So, where in could this flea guilty be? Oh, okay, except in that drop which it sucked from thee. It's kind of like she said, there, Killed the little baby that you were talking about growing with it. Yet thou triumphed. What's that mean? Thou triumphs. What is the absent auditor, the person listening, listening to this, apparently doing? Me, 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 me. I killed your stupid flea. Now what do you want to talk about? You triumph. And you say that you find not thyself nor me the weaker now. Well, you said that my blood was in this flea. I should feel a little weaker now that the flea is dead. I don't feel any weaker. You don't look any weaker. So your whole poem doesn't work. And then the speaker does what? 
He tightens the noose. It is true. You're right. You're not any weaker. I'm not any weaker. Then learn how false fears be. What fears? Go back to line six. A sin, nor shame, nor loss of me. Just so much honor when thou yieldst to me. That is, give it up, honey. Give me what I want. Just so much honor when you yield to me will waste as this flea's death took life from thee. You think that your chastity is the source of your honor. And the speaker is going, come on. Who's got to know? You won't lose any honor. Okay? So, some people have read this poem as it is some kind of serious attempt to pick up a woman. Like, a guy sidles up next to a girl in a bar and goes, hey, babe. It starts, you know, this. I don't know about you, but I would put money on the table that if I tried that, you know what would happen? I'd walk away with a big old handprint across my face. At the least. It's not a serious come on. It's not a serious pickup. So then, if it's not, what's the purpose for it? What's the idea? Is this about romantic love? I had one person in my first class go, it's kind of about romance. And I was like, really? Because two girls sitting up here both chuckled. And I said, I kind of agree with their view of your view of romantic love. Because that's pretty sick and twisted if, if that's your view. Okay? And everybody laughed. And I said, that's the point. A lot of you chuckled at this. Why? Because the poet is trying to do kind of mental gymnastics. The poet wants you to see this as being extremely witty. After all, what has he done? He's compared, metaphysical conceit, sex, something that ought to be pleasurable and, you know, sacred kind of thing, with what? A blood-sucking parasite. You don't want to be thinking of this when you're thinking of this. And what has he done? It's like a marriage. That would probably kill an awful lot of marriages if you started talking like that in an uh, engagement, let's say. Okay, turn from there to page 910. My Last Duchess. We're going to try to do two more. We're not going to get through. We're going to try to do two more. I think I figured out we've got about 26, 27 poems left and nine days of class. So we're going to try to do about three poems a day. Some days we might do a little bit more. Some days we might do a little bit less. So My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. My Last Duchess is an example of that poetic form we talked about. Dramatic monologue, okay, where you have a speaker, and the speaker is addressing somebody, and the speaker accidentally gives away a little bit more about his or her character than is intended, okay? I do this after the flea, because Dunn's The Flea, and many, many others of Dunn's poems, are kind of like precursors to dramatic monologues, that is... You have a speaker, and the speaker is addressing somebody. The only difference is the speaker doesn't betray some kind of hidden or dark aspect of his or her character. Dramatic monologue, the speaker always betrays some darker aspect of his or her character. So, Browning's My Last Duchess. You can Google on YouTube if you want. Um, Julian Glover, My Last Duchess. Julian Glover is a famous British actor. Played the bad American Nazi sympathizer in Indiana Jones and um, not the Last Crusade. Indiana Jones. It, maybe it was the Last Crusade. Yeah, I think it was. Anyways, you get the subhead or a subtitle, Ferrara, and a footnote telling you that in the 16th century, the Duke of this Italian city arranged to marry a second time after the mysterious death of his 
young first wife. Might help to understand that, might not. I think all that, the reason that's there for is Browning is telling us, I know this historical story. Here's kind of my poetic, fictional take on it. So it's a monologue. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. What does the looking as if tell us? She did. She did. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day. Fra Pandolf isn't a real painter. He's a painter that Browning refers to in several of his poems. But he wasn't real. Browning creates him. Right? But he's supposed to be a famous painter. You could replace it with Rembrandt, if you want. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day. And there she stands. Yeah, it is. It took him quite a while to paint her. Will it please you sit and look at her? I said Fra Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself they turn, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I, and seemed as they would ask me if they durst, how such a glance came there. So not the first are you to turn. And ask thus, who normally looks at this painting on the wall? Only this duke. And those whom he shows the painting to. Okay? And those he shows the painting to, he tells us, always ask, how did she get that blush in her cheek? That is, why is she blushing slightly? What, what caused it? And so he says, Sir, t'was not her husband's presence only. Well, who is her husband? Me, the speaker. So, it wasn't my presence only that caused that light color in her cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say, while she was modeling for him, called to say, or chance to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much. In other words, show me more skin. Or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. That little tinge of blush. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought. That is, she blushes slightly because she thinks Fra Pandolf is being courteous. What's Fra Pandolf actually doing? He's flirting. Or more. Right? So, he says, and that was cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad. Too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. What does that mean? She liked what she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. The wet air doesn't necessarily mean people. It means this is a person who's generally pleased by life. She looks outside. She sees a beautiful tree. She smiles. She looks at the dark evergreen. She smiles. She looks at people. She smiles. She looks at a sunset. She smiles. She's easily pleased. Is that a problem? Well, the speaker says, Sir, t'was all one. My favor at her breast, that is, the jewel I gave her to wear at her breast, around her chain. What? The dropping of the daylight in the west. The sunset. The bough of cherry some officious fool broke in the orchard for her. The white mule she rode around the terrace. All and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least. She liked the gem I gave her equally to the bough of cherry some idiot broke off from the tree in the, in the grove, which she liked equally to riding around on a white donkey, which she liked equally to the sunset in the west. 
What's the problem here for him? What should she like more in that grouping? I gave it to her. It should mean more to her. So he says, she thanked them. Good. But thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. Guy brings her a bowl of cherries. She likes that as much as she likes the fact that she got to marry into my 900-year-old family. What characteristic is our Duke betraying? What fault? Because always, betraying, it's something dark about him. Wayne, is it trust? Jealousy. What's he jealous of? Does he think she's cheating on him? No. So what's he jealous of? She doesn't appreciate him. She doesn't know, you know. She doesn't value what I give to her, what I bring for her, etc. So he says, who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Well, he's stooping to blame. But he implies, well, I wouldn't do that. Even had you skill in speech, which I am not, to make your will clear to such an one. How do you make your will clear to such an one? Quit smiling at other people bringing you gifts. Smile more for me. Shakespeare wrote a whole play about that idea. It's called King Lear, where a father is going to divide up his kingdom among his three daughters, and the daughters who will get the largest portions are the daughters who love him the most. And so he asks... Reagan, how much do you love me? Oh, I love you this much, Teddy. Goner, how much? I love you this much. Cordelia, the youngest, the one he loves the most, she says, I love you as a father, as a daughter ought to love her father. It's like, what? I love you as a daughter ought to love her father. Nothing more. Nothing more? Yeah, nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. You better amend that speech. What's he want from her? She's the one he loves the most. I want you to tell me you love me more than your sisters do. She's like, I can't, can't do that because I'm going to get married someday. And then I'm going to transfer my love to my husband. Why? Because that's how it ought to be, Dad. Because Dad's a crazy old man. So, just this or that and you disgust me. Here you miss or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so nor plainly set her wits to yours, that if she disagreed or angered you, forsooth and made excuse, even then would be some stooping. And I choose never to stoop. What does it mean to stoop? I just had to. You have to bend over. You have to humble yourself. What's he saying? I've got a 900 years old name, honey. I don't stoop for you. You do what? You stoop for me. Oh, she smiled. No doubt when e'er I passed her. In other words, it's not like when she saw me, she flipped me off. She frowned. No, she smiled. What's the problem? But who passed without much the same smile? She doesn't smile more at me. This grew. Meaning, it went on. I gave commands. Then all smiles stopped together. What commands did he give? I know a guy. <laughs> Take out the missus. And there she stands, as if alive. Now, your little sub thing says there was a duke in Italy who killed his implant. His young wife died of mysterious causes. There she stands, as if alive. Will it please you rise? You know, let's pause for just a moment. That's my last duchess painted on the wall. What does last imply? More than one. It's almost like, there's my last duchess. Oh, you want to see behind this curtain? Yeah, that was my last duchess. 
when we keep going down the stairs, there's... Will it please you rise? We'll meet the company below then. I repeat, to count your master's no munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. Though his fair daughter's self as I avowed, and starting is my object. So he's talking to this person about what? What's the entire setting? What's the context? What are they going downstairs to do or to finalize? To count your masters, fair munificence, that is, this guy is liberal with his money, about what? He's negotiating what? A new marriage. Why? Because we hear the word dowry. He won't make what? No just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. Yeah, I'll marry your daughter, but she has to bring with her pile of money. And because of his fair munificence, his liberal generosity, he'll, he won't say no. Nay, we'll go together down, sir. Nay means no. So why does the speaker say that? What does the person listening try to do? We'll go together down, sir. Why go together? What's this servant wanting to do? He doesn't want to go down together. He gets up and starts to go before the speaker. Why? Yeah, I better get down there and warn him. Because his daughter might end up hanging on the wall. How do you know? Oh, you see that? You notice Neptune taming a seahorse? Thought of rarity, which Klaus Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. So he's mentioned Frau Pandolf, now Klaus of Innsbruck. This guy's obviously an art collector. He likes beautiful things to put on the walls. What's the problem with a beautiful woman that's still alive? Put her on the wall. Well, you can't put her on the wall until she's dead. But she's what? Hopefully. Okay, ladies, if any of you get married, are you just going to automatically, and I, I don't want to get into your religious tradition or anything like that, are you going to automatically do everything and anything your husband automatically wants you to do? You can catch some chicken going, hell no. <laughs> he wants what out of a quote-unquote what? He wants a work of art. We have a phrase today for older men who ditch their wives to marry younger wives. What are those younger wives called? Um, okay, it could be that, depending on how young they are. You don't want to go trophy wives. Because what do you do with trophies? You put them up on walls for people to see. Okay, we don't have time for the next one. Um, so, we're going to have to get caught up somehow. Ode on a Grecian urn is the next thing we will do on, no, yeah, Ode on a Grecian urn on Monday. Might be a quiz on Monday. If there is, it'll be over the poems. We've done the last couple days. The poetic terms that we haven't or have done might be some of the same terms. I'm not saying we are having a quiz. I'm saying there might be one. Time is wearing down.